Anja Dahlmann, a political scientist and researcher at Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, a Berlin-based think tank. Here we go. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I'll probably neither cut myself nor propose, but I hope it's still interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about um, preventive arms control and international humanitarian law. Um, and during, in this international debate around autonomous weapons, this type of weapon is also referred to as lethal autonomous weapon system, short laws, or also killer robots. So if I say laws, I mostly mean these weapons and not like legal laws just to confuse you a bit. Okay, um, I will discuss this topic along uh, three questions. First of all, what are we actually talking about here? What are autonomous weapons? Uh, second, why should we even care about this? Why is this important? And third, how could this issue be addressed on an international level? So, um, I'll go through my slides anyway. <laughs> um, what are we talking about here? Well, um, during the international negotiations, so far no real, uh, no common definition has been, uh, has been found. So states parties try to find something or not. Uh, and for my presentation, I will just use a very broad definition of autonomous weapons, um, which is weapons that can, once activated, execute a broad range of tasks or select and engage targets without further human intervention. And that's just a very broad spectrum of, uh, of weapons that might fall under this definition. Uh, actually, some existing ones are there as well, which you can't see here. Um, that would be the Phalanx system, for example. Uh, it's been around since the 1970s. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. um, sorry. So Phalanx system has been around since the 1970s, a US uh, system, air defense system based on ships. And it's meant to uh, just uh, yeah, defend the ship against incoming objects uh, from the air. So that's around for, has been around for quite a long time, um, and it might be even part of this law's definition or not, but just to give you an impression how broad this range is. Today we've got, for example, uh, demonstrators like the Tyranus drone, um, a UK system, or the X-74B, uh, um, which can, for example, autonomously land <laughs> um, land on aircraft carriers and can be air, air refueled and stuff like that, which is apparently quite impressive um, if you don't need a human to do that. And in the future, there might be uh, even, or there probably will be, even more autonomous functions. So navigation, landing, refueling, all that stuff. Uh, uh, that's, you know, old. Um, but at some point, there might be, weapons might be able to choose their own munition according to the situation. Uh, they might be able to choose their target and decide when to engage with the target without any human intervention at some point. Um, and that's quite problematic, I will tell you why that's in a minute. Overall, you can see that there is a, yeah, gradually decline, a gradual decline of human control over uh, weapon systems or over weapons and the use of force. Um, so that's a very short and broad impression of what we're talking about here and talking about definitions it's always interesting what you're not talking about and that's why I want to address some misconceptions in the public debate. Um, first of all, uh, when we talk about machine autonomy, also artificial intelligence, with, uh, intelligence which is the uh, technology behind this, people, not you probably, <laughs> uh, in the media and in the broader public often get the idea that these machines might have some kind of real intelligence or intention or are an entity on their own right and they're just not. It's just statistical methods, it's just math and you know way more about this than I do so I will leave it with this and just say that or highlight that they have these machines, these weapons have certain competences for specific tasks. They are not entities on their own right, they are not intentional. And that's important when we talk about ethical and legal challenges afterwards. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. That is. And the other, in connection with this, um, there's another one. 
which is the plethora of Terminator references in the media as soon as you talk about autonomous weapons, mostly referred to as killer robots in this context. And just in case you intend to write an article about this, don't use a Terminator picture. Please don't, because it's really unhelpful to understand where the problems are. Um, with this kind of thing, people assume that we have problems as, uh, when we have machines with a human-like intelligence, which look like the Terminator or something like this. Um, and the problems start really way before that. They start when you use assisting systems, when you have men uh, or human uh, machine teaming, uh, or when you accumulate a couple of autonomous functions through the targeting cycle. Um, so through the ste military steps that lead to the use of force or lead to the killing of people. And that's not, this is really not our problem at the moment. So please keep this in mind because it's not just semantic, semantics to, uh, to differ, uh, differentiate between these two things. It really manages the expectations of political and military decision makers. Okay, so now we've got kind of an impression of what I'm talking about here. So why should we actually talk about this? What's all the fuss about? Um, actually, autonomous weapons have or would have quite a few military adva advantages. They might be in some cases faster or even more precise than humans. And you don't need a constant communication link. Um, so you don't, have, you don't have to worry about instable communication links, you don't have to worry about latency or detection or uh, vulnerability of this specific link. Um, so yay. Um, and a lot of very, let's say, interesting military options come from that. Um, people talk about uh, stealthy operations in shallow waters, for example, or um, yeah, remote missions in secluded areas, things like that, and you can get very creative with uh, tiny sw robots and swarms, for example. Um, so shiny new options, but, and of course there is a but, uh, there, it comes as a, at a price, because you have at least three dimensions of challenges in this, uh, on this regard. First of all, the legal ones. When we talk about these weapons, uh, they, might, uh, they will be applied in uh, conflicts where international humanitarian law, IHL, applies. And IHL consists of quite a few very abstract uh, principles. Mm. For example, principle of distinction between uh, combatants and civilians, principle of proportionality or a military necessity. They are very abstract and they def I'm pretty sure they will need, always need uh, a human judgment to interpret these, these principles and apply them to dynamic situations. Um, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong later. Uh, so that's one thing. So um, if you remove the human from the targeting cycle, this human judgment might be missing. Um, and therefore military decision makers have to evaluate very carefully um, the quality of human control and human judgment within the targeting cycle. Um, so, that's law. Second dimension of challenges are uh, security issues. Uh, when you look at these uh, new systems, they are cool and shiny, and uh, as most new types of weapons, they, are, they have the potential to stir an arms race between, uh, between states. So, they actually might make conflicts more likely just because they're there and states want to have them and feel threatened by them. Second aspect is proliferation. Autonomy is based on software. So software can be easily transferred. It's really hard to control and all the other components, or most of the other components you will need are available on the civilian market. So you can build this stuff on your own if you're smart enough. Um, so we have, might have more conflicts from these uh, types of weapons and it might might get, well, uh, more difficult to control the application of this technology. And the third one, which is especially worrying for me, is the as potential for escalation within the conflict, especially when you have, uh, when both or more th sides uh, use lethal autonomous weapons. Um, you have these very complex adversary th systems and it will become very hard to predict how they are going to interact. Um, they will increase the speed of the um, of the conflict and a human might not even have a chance to process what's going on there. Um, so that's really worrying and we can see for example in high frequency trading um, at the stock markets where problems arise there and how difficult it is for humans to understand what's going on there. 
Uh, so that are, that are some of the security issues there. And the last and maybe maybe most important one are ethics. Mm. <laughs> As I mentioned before, um, when you use autonomy in weapons or in machines, you have artificial intelligence, so you don't have a real intention, a real entity that's behind this. So the killing decision might at some point be based on statistical methods and no one will be involved there. And that's, well, worrying for a lot of reasons, but also it could constitute a violation of human dignity. You can argue that humans have, well, you can kill humans in, in war, um, but they at least have the right to be killed by another human, or at least by the decision of another human. But we can discuss this later. So at least on this regard, it would be highly unethical. And that really just scratches the surface of problems and challenges that would arise from the use of lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, I haven't even touched on uh, the problems with training data, with accountability, with verification and all that uh, funny stuff because I only have 20 minutes, of course. So, uh, sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? So how can this issue be addressed? Um, Luckily, states have, thanks to a huge campaign of NGOs, noticed that there might be some problems and there might be necessity to address this issue. And they're currently doing this in the UN Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, CCW, uh, where they discuss a potential ban of the development and use of lethal autonomous weapons or of weapons uh, that lack meaningful human control over the use of force. There are several ideas around there. Um, and such a ban would be really the maximum goal of the NGOs there, but it becomes increasingly unlikely that this happens. Most states do not agree with a complete ban, they want to regulate it a bit here, a bit there, and they really can't find a common, common definition, as I mentioned before. Uh, because if you have a broad definition, as, just as I used it, uh, you will notice that you have existing systems in there that might be not that problematic or that you just don't want to ban and you might uh, stop civilian or commercial developments, which you also don't want to do. So states are a bit stuck on this regard. And they also really challenge the notion that we need a preventive arms control here, so that we need to act before these systems are applied on the battlefield. Um, uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, this is the fourth year or something, of these negotiations um, and we will see how it goes uh, this year and if states can't find a common ground there it becomes increasingly li or, yeah, it becomes likely that it will change to another forum just like with anti-personnel mines for example which uh, where the, the treaty was found uh, outside of the United Nations. Mm. But yeah, the window of opportunity really closes and states and NGOs have to act uh, there and yeah, keep uh, keep on track there. Just as a side note, uh, probably quite a few people are uh, members of NGOs, so um, if you look at the campaign to stop killer robots with a big campaign behind this, uh, this process, um, there's only one German NGO which is uh, facing finance, so if you're, especially if you're a German NGO and are interested in AI, it might be worthwhile to look into the military dimension as well. We really need uh, some uh, expertise on that regard, especially on AI and uh, these technologies there. Okay, so just in case you fell asleep during the last 15 minutes, I want you to take away three key messages. Please, be aware of the trends and internal logic that lead to autonomy in weapons. Do not overestimate the abilities of autonomy, of autonomous machines like intent and these things. And because you probably all, all knew this already, please tell people about this, tell other people about this, educate them. Uh, about this type of technology. And third, don't underestimate the potential dangers uh, for security and human dignity that comes from this uh, type of weapon. I hope that I could interest you a bit more in this, uh, in this particular issue. If you want to learn more, you can find really interesting sources on the website of the uh, CCW at the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots and uh, from a uh, research project that I happen to work in. Uh, the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons. We do have a few studies on that regard and we're going to publish a few more. So uh, please check this out and thank you for your attention.
questions. <clears throat> Sorry. So we have some time for questions and answers mm -hmm. now, okay. First of all, I have to apologize that we had a hiccup with the signing language. The acoustics over here on the, on the stage was so bad that she didn't could do the, uh, her job. So I'm terrible, sorry about that. We fixed it in the talk and my apologies for that. Um, we are queuing here on the microphones already, so we start with microphone number one. Your question, please. Thanks for your talk, Anja. Don't you think there is a possibility to reduce war crimes as well by taking away the decision from humans and by having algorithms to decide which are actually auditable? Um, yeah, that's actually that's something that is discussed in the international debate as well, that, there might, that machines might be more ethical than humans could be. And, well, of course, they won't uh, just start raping uh, women because they want to, but you can program them to do this. So um, <laughs> you just you, you shift the problems really. Um, and also, maybe these machines don't get angry, but they don't show compassion either. So if you are there and you're a potential target, they just won't stop. They will just kill you and do not think want to think about this. So you have to really uh, look at both sides there, I guess. Thanks. So we switch over to microphone three, please. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, regarding autonomous uh, cars, uh, self-driving cars, there's a similar discussion going on regarding the ethics. How should a car react in a case of an accident? Should it protect uh, people outside, people inside? What are the laws? So there is another discussion there. Um, do you work with um, um, people in this area or is, this, um, is there any collaboration? Um, maybe there's less collaboration than one might think there is. Um, of course, we, we monitor this debate as well. Um, and yeah, we think about the possible applications of the outcomes, for example, from this German Ethical Commission on Self-Driving Cars uh, for our work. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit torn there because when you talk about weapons, they are designed to kill people and cars mostly are not. <laughs> so with this ethical committee, you want to avoid killing people or decide what happens when this accident occurs. Uh, so they are a bit, a bit different. Um, but of course, yeah, you can learn a lot from, from both uh, discussions and we are aware of that. <laughs> Thanks, then we're gonna go over in the back. Microphone number two, please. Uh, also from me, thanks again for this talk and infusing all this uh, professionalism into the debate uh, because uh, some of the uh, surroundings of, um, of uh, our, our, so to say, our scene, scenery, um, they like to protest against uh, very specific things like, for example, the Rammstein Air Base. And uh, in my view, that's a bit misguided if you just uh, go out and protest in a populistic way without uh, involving uh, these points of expertise that you offer. And so thanks again for that. And um, then my question, uh, how would you propose that protests um, progress and develop themselves uh, to, a, to a higher level to be, uh, on the one hand, more effective and, on the other hand, um, more considerate of what is at stake uh, on all the levels and on all sides involved? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, first, the Rammstein issue is, is a completely, actually a completely different topic. Um, it's drone warfare, uh, remotely piloted drones, so there are a lot of a lot of problems with this and with targeting killings, but it's not about lethal autonomous weapons uh, in particular. Um, well, if you, if you want to uh, be a part of this international debate, there's of course this campaign to stop killer robots, um, and they have a lot of really good uh, people and a lot of resources, uh, sources, literature, and things like that to really educate yourself uh, on what's going on there. So that would be a starting point, and then, yeah, just keep talking to scientists about this and uh, find out where, where we see the problems and uh, I mean it's always helpful for scientists too to talk to uh, people in the field so to say. Um, so yeah, keep talking. <laughs> Thanks for that and the signal angel signal that we have something from the internet. Thank you. <clears throat> Question from IRC. Aren't we already in a killer robot world where a botnet can attack a nuclear power plant for example? What do you think? I really didn't understand a word, I didn't I'm sorry. understand that as well. So can you, can okay. you speak closer to the microphone, please? Yes. 
aren't we already in a killer robot world? Sorry, that doesn't work. Sorry, sorry, we stopped that there. We can't hear sorry. it over here, sorry. Okay. Um, we're going to switch over to microphone two then, please. I have one little question. So, um, in your talk, you were focusing on the uh, ethical questions related to lethal weapons. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of um, ongoing discussions regarding the ethical aspects of um, the design and implementation of less than lethal autonomous weapons for crowd control and similar purposes? Um, yeah, actually, um, within the CCW, every term of this lethal autonomous weapon systems is disputed, also the lethal aspect. Um, and for the regulation, it might be easier to focus on this for now because uh, less than lethal weapons come with their own, own problems. Um, and the question if they are ethical and if they can, if IGL applies to them. But I'm not really deep into this discussion, so I'll just have to leave it right, there. Thanks, anyway. <laughs> yeah. thanks, and back here to microphone one, please. Hi, thank you for the talk very much. Um, my question is in the context of the decreasing cost of both the hardware and software over the next, say, 20, 40 years, outside of a nation state context, mm -hmm. like private forces or non-nation state actors gaining use of these weapons, do things like the UN Convention or the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots apply, or are they considering private individuals trying to leverage these against others? Mm, I'm not sure what the campaign says about this, so I'm, I'm not a member there, but yeah. <laughs> um, the, the CCW mostly focuses on international humanitarian law, um, which is important, but I think it's, it, it's not broad enough. So questions like proliferation and all this connected to your question are not uh, really, uh, or, or probably won't be part of uh, regulation there. It's discussed on the, on the edges of the, of the debates and negotiations there, but it's, it doesn't seem to be a really issue, real issue there. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. And over to microphone six, please. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. As a researcher, do you know how far the development has gone already? So how, how transparent or transparent is your look into what is being developed and researched on the side of military, working, military people working with autonomous weapons and developing them? Mm. Um, well, for me, it's quite transparent because I only have only access to public, uh, publicly available sources, so uh, I don't really know what, what's going on behind closed doors in the military or uh, in the industry. Uh, there, of course, you can, you can monitor the civilian applications or developments, which can tell a lot about the, uh, the state of the art. And, uh, for example, uh, DARPA, the American um, Development Agency, um, they publish sometimes a call for uh, call for papers, that's not the term, but uh, there you can see where, in which areas they're interested in. And for example, they really like this idea of an uh, autonomous killer bug that can act in swarms and monitor or uh, even kill people and things like that. So yeah, we try to, to piece, it, piece it together in our work. We do have a little bit more time. Are you okay to answer more questions? Sure. Then we're going to switch over to microphone three, please. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I think we are living already in a world of lethal, auto auto uh, lethal <laughs> autonomous weapon systems. If you think about uh, these millions of landmines which are operating, and so the question is, shouldn't it be possible uh, to ban uh, these weapon systems the same as uh, landmines are already banned by several uh, countries? Uh, so just include them in, in that definition, and uh, because the arguments should be very similar. Mm. Yeah, it does, it does come to mind, of course, uh, because these mines are just lying around there and no one's interacting, then you step on them and uh, boom. Um, but they are, well, it depends, <laughs> it depends, first of all, a bit of your definition um, of autonomy. Um, so some say autonomous is when you act in dynamic situations and the other ones would be automated and things like that. And I think um, this autonomy aspect, I really don't want to find Want, don't want to find, define autonomy here, really. Um, but this, this action in more dynamic spaces and the aspect of machine learning and uh, all these things, they are way more complex and they bring different problems than just landmines. Landmines are problematic and anti-personnel mines are banned for good reasons, but they don't have the same problems, I think. 
so it won't be, I don't think it would, won't be sufficient to just put the laws in there, at least electronic weapons. Thank you very much. I can't see anyone else queuing up, so therefore, Anya, thank you very much. Thank you. That's your applause. And once again, my apologies that that didn't work.